Parks are a unique form of cultural expression, reflecting America's complex history and evolving values. Motivated by the belief that time in nature dramatically improves health, Frederick Law Olmsted and other 19th century cultural leaders advocated for the creation of parks for the American people. As a result of these efforts, a movement was born, and many parks, urban, state, and national, were created throughout the country. But in the South, with its Jim Crow laws, emerging state parks were officially restricted to white-only access. While some parks were constructed specifically for black visitors under the premise of separate but equal, they were dramatically inferior to the new state parks that welcomed white visitors. As we continue to celebrate state parks as integral to the American landscape, we are only now beginning to tell their full story. These were the cabins where we stayed over here because they had a little front porch and then they had the shutters on the side and it looks like there was a back porch. This is Camp Whispering Pines in the Reedy Creek State Park, which was a segregated park that we came to uh, from Durham. This was the Negro Scout Camp, as we called it in those days, out in the woods and nature. And this really seemed a long way from the city. I, I remember those days fondly when I think about my childhood. This is the first time I've been back since I was a scout in the early 60s. It's just like I remembered it, yeah. It's coming back. National parks are more widely celebrated in the American imagination as visible symbols of democracy. But state parks were also envisioned to fulfill ideals of equal access for all citizens. The national parks tended to be clustered out in the western parts of the United States, and they were fairly remote and inaccessible to most Americans. In the 1920s, a gentleman named Stephen Mather realized that there were lots and lots of parcels around the country that were scenic, but they weren't quite spectacular enough for national park status. So he began this movement towards building state parks, and he created this conference on state parks. In the words of conference organizers, the parks would provide health-giving playgrounds for each and every man, woman, and child. But throughout the South, every person did not include black Americans who were excluded from nearly all of the new parks. Equality was never on the table in any sense in Southern life. Really, the point of Jim Crow was to demonstrate inequality and to display racial hierarchy for everyone to see. So when you think about the design of state parks, it codified this inequality into the landscape. Throughout the 1920s, park construction in the South was hindered by the region's relative poverty. Many Southern states lacked a parks agency altogether. But when the New Deal was enacted in 1933, an influx of federal resources began to reduce these limitations. Here also additional cabins are being constructed with emergency conservation work funds and civilian conservation corps labor. Over the next decade, the National Park Service directed state park planning, implementing their designs through the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration. On the one hand, the National Park Service itself practiced a policy of non-discrimination. In a practical sense, though, they very much catered to the wishes of Southern officials who did not want facilities for Black Americans in their backyards and in their communities. Reedy Creek State Park, that was a very unusual situation. In fact, park spaces were so rare in the South that Black campers would have to travel for hundreds of miles in many cases to get access to any space. 
And the possibility of travel during that time was very dangerous. So many just didn't make those kinds of trips. And as I remember, this was sort of like the main store or entrance. You see, it's different from design. It has a side porch and a little window. But I think we entered and checked in right here. And so as you can see, you know, the small cabins ring around this large opening. And you'd have those little stations set up where they would teach the different merit badges. And you would go to those and rotate through the day and then come back here for lunch and then for dinner. You can look in on a cabin like this and, and say, you know, this was something from the 1930s and we used it in the 50s and 60s and thought we were enjoying nature. But for me, what was happening that was important was what was happening inside. The friendships and the stories, that really transformed who I became as a person and coming to a camp like this, which was really what they were trying to achieve back in the New Deal in setting up these camps. But there were just a handful of black camps throughout the state. So the, obviously there were communities who didn't have this opportunity. The most common expression of a black American park in the South during this era was a small space for day use only with picnic tables, maybe a fishing pier, maybe a ball field, and nothing more. The idea of having overnight cabins was fairly rare, but even when there were overnight cabins, the inequality between black spaces and white spaces was very evident. You can see this best expressed in Lake Murray State Park in Oklahoma. The inequality between the white and black spaces is vast. In the white camping areas, you can see the New Deal architecture, that kind of rustic look with stone chimneys, log rafters, and detailed architecture. Whereas if you go further south to the other end of the park, at the south end of the lake, there was another youth camp set up for black campers. The architecture there was basically rectangular shacks with no embellishments architecturally and very, very poor in quality in comparison with the white sections of the park. Ultimately, the New Deal did little to rectify the tremendous inequality in recreational access. Only nine of the many state parks constructed throughout the South during this era were accessible, on a segregated basis, to black Americans. The state of Texas alone had constructed about three dozen state parks, but none were open to black citizens. As the federal government shifted its resources during World War II, park construction slowed nationwide until the war's end. World War II was a watershed moment in black civil rights history. Many black American men traveled overseas to fight in the war and saw a glimpse of life beyond discrimination. And they brought that home with them and began to demand greater equality in the United States. In addition, during the war, there were greater economic activities for black Americans in the South, and it created an expansion of the black middle class, which also created a desire to access these park spaces. The NAACP, their legal defense fund, set a policy of only accepting desegregated spaces, so there was no longer this sense of accepting segregated spaces, but demanding desegregation of white spaces. And you begin to see Southern park agencies becoming very concerned about this direction. Alarmed by the prospect of integrated state parks, Southern agencies increased efforts to demonstrate that they were working to meet the separate but equal standard. Some of the early cases demanding desegregation were in South Carolina. There was an effort to desegregate Edisto State Park, and the South Carolina Park Agency basically closed the park for many years subsequent to that lawsuit being filed. 
By 1955, the Supreme Court finally weighed in on park segregation, a year after they ruled on Brown versus Board of Education, and it affirmed that park segregation, like school segregation, was unconstitutional. The states along the northern edge of the South, they desegregated their parks pretty quickly after the Supreme Court ruling in 1955. Most of the states, however, maintained segregation for a decade after. In some cases, states joined what we call the massive resistance movement. The idea was that these states would never accept desegregation in their parks ever. Other states pointed to this notion that maybe there's going to be violence, and because of public safety, we need to be cautious and move slowly. Demands for desegregation increased as Black activists conducted wade-in protests, entering the ocean at white-only state park beaches. Even though the Supreme Court kept its hands off segregation cases for a number of years, they weighed in in 1963 in a case called Watson v. Memphis, which said that You've taken too long, you have to desegregate these parks now, and that's the final word. South Carolina saw that and decided they would just close their park system completely. And they did that for about a year. The desegregation process in parks never really completed fully because there was a de facto segregation that ensued after the fall of Jim Crow these parks were first founded on a fully exclusionary basis. That set a pattern in motion that has existed for generations and generations. For most people, the Jim Crow foundations of Southern state park systems were forgotten in the years that followed. There's no signage about it. There's no, there are no markers and there's no interpretation. So you said you've been hiking here since 1996? We've been all over it in, in these 25 years. Never heard that there was any segregation here or anything. And these cabins were built during the New Deal. I bet I'm not the only one. I bet there are tons of people who have oh, no I, idea I you the history of this park. Even though most of the landscapes retain traces of their segregated design, what remains of that past is all but invisible to contemporary visitors. This is something to take in after all these years. I mean, we'd come right in here and run on the platform and then dive into the lake. Most remnants of segregated design are known only to those with local knowledge and memories of the era. Parks have been for a long time a marker of American identity. We see ourselves as a landscape nation with our vast spaces and our opportunities to explore them but we often don't talk as much about the negative parts of that history. And I think dealing with these very fraught parts of history are very important to us as a nation moving forward. Today, there's a very exciting and very interesting movement among Black Americans to regain access to these outdoor spaces that have been closed off to them in the past. There are organizations that make great efforts to encourage more and more Black Americans to go out to these great outdoor spaces, so to speak. That's important because these parks were promised as a legacy to all Americans. State parks can transport us. Just out here, you feel a part of something bigger than yourself, and you can just enjoy being out in this setting. I, I think that's what parks can do. They, not necessarily bring us together, but allow us to have a different sense of ourselves. That's, that's just a, quite a, that's a gift.
about American landscape history, visit LALH.org.